Welcome to the Easy Baby Podcast, where we share practical tips and information to make your pregnancy and the first months of your baby's life the best they can be. Visit easybaby.co.za for more information on our online courses. Hello, moms and dads, and welcome to the Easy Baby podcast series. It's fantastic to have you back with us. Uh, Today's episode nine, and we're going to be talking about burping babies. Now, today is quite a special show because it is based on a talk that I'm giving at the moment at uh, the Peekaboo Expo at Santon Convention Center. I have been talking on a group of panelists. Uh, We've had a couple of really, really great people across, Unifin Starden, who was on our sleep podcast has been there giving advice. Uh, the same as Sam Crompton, our lactation consultant that was helped us out with our breastfeeding episode. So all of us have been there and we've been doing our little talks and uh, helping parents along the way uh, the best way we know how. So today I'm going to give you my talk that I am doing there at the moment and it's about burping babies. Please keep in mind as we get into today's episode that the Easy Baby podcast series is for reference only and nothing we say here should take the place of your medical practitioner and his or her expertise when it comes to the diagnosis and treatment of your babies. So I'm a chiropractor and I've been working for about uh, about 11 years now, seeing babies for about 10 of those years. And I started seeing babies before I had my own children. And I think that's quite an important point to start with because I used to give out some weird advice before I had children. I used to tell parents to do this at two in the morning and that at four in the morning and they had to follow this regimen. And when I had children, I started to realize maybe that's not quite the way to go about this thing. Um, maybe what we need to do is rather rather than tell parents what to do is give them tools. Give parents things we can use at home because that's what I desperately looked for when I became a new parent. I needed tools and I think it is a man thing because men are fixers and we need a tool to be able to attack the problem with where the moms are more the maintenance people and uh, the long haul people. Dads sort of swoop in and we want to fix something. So what we looked at in practice was let's put together some tools for parents. Now, our burping techniques that we've put together, are that's one such tool that you can take home and use because there's a certain amount that we can help in practice. And what we do with the adjustments lasts for a certain amount of time. But if you can back that up with great technique and great winding technique, great technique when it comes to getting farts out of babies, uh, a lot of the techniques we use, it makes life a lot easier. So why did I focus on burping so much? Well, I found that burping tended to be this underlying cause of so much stress in babies. And it's ridiculous because we know that. It's in every magazine, it's in every textbook, it's in every blog that we talk about. You have to burp a baby and because if the air gets stuck inside, baby will be upset until they really push and they are able to fart the air out or they're able to burp the air out and then they'll relax. Which is fine and well, but what we never get told is how do I burp my baby? When do I know my baby is burped? Um, How do I know how long to burp for? And how do I know I'm even doing the correct thing? So what we did in practice is we had a look at how does air flow through the human body? What are the physics of the air pressures inside a human? And what is it that makes babies so unique? What is so special about their anatomy that uh, they need to be burped uh, and adults don't? And, uh, and how do we burp them and, and why do we do these things? So it's no one's fault that we don't know how to win babies because basically no one is out there teaching it. As I say, everyone's just sort of talking the big picture, but no one's really giving specifics, which is why we got into this and why we want to counter this sort of lack of understanding when it comes to the physics and the science behind winding children. 
So if you want to have a good night's sleep and you do have a niggly baby, the best place to start is getting your winding technique up to scratch. And the reason is because it's such a fantastic starting point because you can reduce so many symptoms without having to do too much to your child. And by getting the winds out, we are following the first principle of working with children medically, and that is do the thing that is the least invasive and do the thing that has the least side effects. So if we can wind babies properly and by doing that get rid of the stomach upsetness and get rid of some possible reflux signs, what we're doing is taking away symptoms without going to a place like medication. And a lot of the babies I see in practice will come in, we teach these techniques, and then lo and behold, they go home and half of the symptoms, 50% of the symptoms generally will drop away straight away. And that is simply because we have taught the parents how to win their babies properly, and they've got this obstruction out of the way. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. What happens when you get air stuck? So the big idea is that when air bubbles get stuck in the gastrointestinal system, they block the passages and pathways, be that in the esophagus, in the stomach, or into the intestines. Either way, they block the progress of food and intestinal juice through that area, um, and it causes a backup, and that causes pain. Also, the, the air itself or the bubbles of air tend to work like a salmon. They want to move upstream. They want to move in the opposite direction, which also causes pressure. So excess air in the stomach ends up causing you three things. The one is too much air inside the stomach itself causes stretching of the gastric or stomach muscle. So the stomach is a muscle and it doesn't like to be completely contracted. It does like to be opened slightly, which we'll talk about just now, but it doesn't like to be overstretched like any other muscle. It doesn't appreciate the overstretch. And when you do overstretch, your body reacts to that. Now, the second way that air interferes is if the air is swallowed from the stomach into the intestines. Now, as we were saying, it blocks the pathways and passages. So that air now has to be pushed down and baby starts to get their fart on, basically. So they pull the knees up to the chest and pull the uh, the fist in and pull the arms in and the face goes red and they really, really bear down. You will have seen your baby even doing this whole bearing down business uh, while they're completely asleep because when they're asleep, the air bubbles move from the stomach to the intestine and they have to get rid of them because it irritates the intestinal muscle. And the third way that excess air in the gastrointestinal system irritates is it can sit right at the bottom valve or the top valve of the stomach, but the bottom valve of the esophagus. Um, And when it sits there, it puts pressure on the valve and can keep the valve slightly open. Now, if you have a situation where the valve is kept slightly open and you have intestinal gas, you have a baby that is pushing and pushing and pushing. And the problem with that is if you're pushing against a valve that's slightly open, you open yourself up to reflux signs. So... One of the debates that is going on at the moment that I am very, very keen to talk about is do you wind or do you burp a breastfed baby? There are a lot of people in this industry and a lot of people that I highly respect that will say you do not have to wind a breastfed baby. I don't agree with that and I'll tell you why. Because the theory of not winding or burping a breastfed baby is that breastfed babies feed slower and bottle-fed babies feed faster. And it is true that one of the two ways of creating a lot of burps is to drink very fast. The other way is to gulp, and we'll talk about that just now. So breastfed babies, yes, it's true they do feed slower unless they have a bad latch, which means that they get a lot of air that comes into the stomach within the first one or two minutes of feeding. Or if a breastfed baby as mom has a fast letdown reflex because then they have to gulp. And by gulping, what happens is babies literally shove the epiglottis closed and they shove the air that comes in down into the stomach. Now, it's not true that bottle-fed babies eat 
fast all the time because we do get teats that slow down the feeding and we do get specialized bottles uh, and we just get some babies that just drink slowly. But underpinning this whole debate of breastfed and bottle fed um, burping babies is that if your baby wants food in their stomach very quickly, they will gulp and there is a reason behind that. And the reason behind that is more important than how they are fed when it comes to winding. And I'm going to explain that now. So the baby that comes to see me with these problems is either a C-section baby or the baby that had an assisted birth, so it was a natural birth but with forceps or with vacuum or ventus, or it was a big baby and a small mom. Can you see where this is all going? Uh, or it was a baby that spent a long time in the active delivery phase or a baby that spent a very short time in the active delivery phase. So either they spent a long time getting concertinaed or they spent too short through the birth canal and they didn't extend their spines open. And I'm sure you've heard this, uh, you've heard this before, is that babies that are not born naturally need to have their spines aligned. Well, that also goes for assisted births and big babies and long or short deliveries. Because the reason behind this is that a baby needs to spend a certain amount of time extending through the birth canal because they are so rolled up uh, in the womb before they're born. So they need to have that extraction out. And if they don't, they all tend to do one very specific thing, which is hyperextension. So these babies that I see in practice tend to arch their heads back. They throw their heads back. They throw their bums back. And you'll pick it up because when you pick them up from sleeping, they'll have their hands right up in front of their face, throw their heads back and throw their bums back. You won't have to wonder if they're doing that because you will look at that and go, oh my goodness, are, can they do that? Are they physically, are they not hurting themselves by doing that? Because they throw themselves back so far. And the reason for doing that is they are trying to get rid of that pressure on their spinal cord for, from being so rolled up in the womb before they were born and not being extended out. Now, that's fine and well, but what ends up happening with the theory, theoretically what ends up happening, is that as they go backwards, they crunch the nerves between the shoulders. They put a lot of pressure on the joints around there that irritates that nerve fiber that goes down to the tummy and down to the intestine. Now you have a tummy that is cramping too much. We call it subclinical. It's not to the point that babies feel it that much, but it's just underneath and the tummy is crunching very tightly down. Now what that means is that when babies wake up to eat, they want to change that tightness of the stomach muscle. And they want to do that by eating as fast as they can. And they're non-discriminant. They'll take in air, they'll take in food, they don't care what they take in. As long as it goes in and it opens up that stomach muscle. And you'll see the difference between a baby that wakes up hungry or a baby that wakes up with that tummy compression. Because a hungry baby wakes up and they sort of relax, they're okay, um, and they'll kind of get to eating. But a baby that wakes up with a stomach compression can't wait to eat. They wake up and they go to from 0 to 100 in two seconds flat, which is exactly the same thing that we would do. Because if as an adult you were to wake up and you were to feel hungry, you wouldn't crash down the security gate to get to the fridge. Um, but if you woke up and your foot was on fire, that might be a consideration because you need to fix it now, now, now. And we can see that these babies have this tummy compression as well because they take all this air in and all this food in and as they extend the tummy, they fall asleep. Straight away they fall asleep because they've been eating in a crisis. And once the crisis is over, what happens? You get very Oh, you get tired because you fixed the crisis. And these babies are notoriously hard to burp because now after they feed, they fall asleep again. So the air gets trapped and they get hard to wind. And here is the kicker because these babies then look like they don't need to be burped. They look like everything's fine and they're now relaxed. And what's happening is that food on the top or that liquid is pushing the gas down. The gas then moves into the intestines and they still look relaxed until four or five hours later when the intestine reacts to that. So generally what I'll see in practice is that a baby will come in 
And the mom will say, well, they're perfect. You know, at 12 o'clock or one in the morning, I feed the baby. She looks wonderful. She's completely relaxed. I put her down. And five in the morning, she goes absolutely ballistic. And that's what's happening. Because if we get that mom to wind the baby properly, that gas does not sit inside the stomach, doesn't go to the intestines, and then doesn't wake them up later. Please feel free to contact the show at any time with questions you may have or topics you would like us to cover in future shows. Email us at info at easybaby.co.za. So as chiropractors, uh, the theory would be that that hyperextension or crunching between the shoulders creates a lot of irritation around that nerve supply. So as chiropractors, what we want to do is get the messages from the brain to the organ and the messages from the organ back to the brain again. We want to get that working. So all we do is we open up those joints between the shoulders and we open up the joints that have to do with other nerve supply that come from higher up and from lower down and allow the nervous system to talk to the body as easily and as uncomplicatedly as possible. Now, one of the things I have been getting at the talks that I've been at now, and this is completely, completely valid. People come up and go, yes, but oh my goodness, you're sending a baby to a chiropractor. Is it, don't they string them upside down and and throw them out of windows? And don't they do all this crazy stuff? And, And no, we don't. Chiropractic for babies is so, so different than chiropractic for adults. It's almost completely a different discipline. And what I generally say, is that it's quite underwhelming to watch because you go in thinking it's going to be horrible. They're going to do this. And then you kind of just watch the baby sort of melt and relax and you go, "But, but where's the horrible part? And that's the thing. There is no horrible part. All that we are focused on is relaxing the baby and allowing the nervous system to express itself through the baby without complication. So what I have been putting up at the talk are just three studies. Um, And I love these studies. The first one is from Voira. And uh, Voira looked at uh, 110 years of spinal manipulation in children. Voira found nine cases of serious adverse events over the past 110 years. And that is with an estimated 30 million annual pediatric visits. I can't do that maths, but the number is relatively big, I'm sure. And then another study comes from Joyce Miller, who is, uh, she's in charge of the pediatric program at the Anglo-European Chiropractic Association. I have had uh, the honor of of, uh, having had lectures from her in the past. She examined about 780 uh, patients under three years old. Uh, They gave over 5,000 chiropractic treatments. This was in England from 2002 to 2004. And no serious adverse events happened. Uh, And more than 85% of the parents reported improvement in the children's symptoms, which is phenomenal. And I then have been putting that against the last um, study, and that is from Bourgeois. And Bourgeois looked over an 11-year period in the USA, looked at the mean number of uh, children that had drug reactions ending in adverse events. So over 11 years, there were over 585,000 cases, of which 131,000 ended in emergency room visits. Children from uh, 0 to 4 years old were the highest visits within this bracket, and the most frequently implicated drug there are antibiotics. Now, I'm not saying that to be completely antibiotic. What I'm saying is I'm just putting the facts forward in terms of safety between chiropractic and medical care. Okay, now there is another thing that we don't look at when it comes to burping babies, and this does go back slightly to the breastfed, bottle-fed argument. Crying and fussing are the biggest causes of babies taking in air. Because when they cry and fuss, they go, (gasps) and they gulp. And they gulp air into, instead of into the lungs, into the stomach. And what happens is they cry and they gulp in air. And because they've gulped air, the air is irritating, so they cry more. 
And they cry and cry and cry, and we go, oh, my goodness, you're hungry. And we feed them when they are full of air already in the stomach, which leads to one of my laws of winding, which is you do not just have to wind babies after you've fed them. You can wind babies happily before, anywhere during the day, because they are capable and they do take in air consistently through the day. Which now, as you can see, if you have a breastfed baby or a bottle-fed baby, that doesn't matter because they are still taking in air and they can still be full of air just before you wind them. And the American Association of Pediatrics agrees with this. They say that we should wind babies uh, consistently even if they don't look like they're in pain. And I agree with that completely because the pain of the air bubble going into the intestine happens later. Okay, so we're going to go through some really stupid stuff now. I'm going to talk about what a burp is, but just bear with me. So a burp is passive. It's it's a relaxation compared to a fart because a fart is a very muscular contractive uh, process where they push the knees up and they push the arms in and they bear right down. When babies burp, they literally roll over and it falls out of their mouth. And that's because burping is a completely passive process. So what happens with burping is you have a high pressure inside the stomach and a low pressure outside in the environment. And we need to link those two with each other to have the air bubble pop out. Now that depends on two very important things. One are valves and reflexes. So the valves that are around the breathing apparatus with babies and their reflexes to keep the food out of the lungs and then positioning. And positioning is what what we have to uh, concern ourselves with. But just a quick word on the valves and the reflexes. Very interestingly, um, as an adult, and you can attempt this now, is try and take a sip of water and breathe in at the same time. For adults, that's a mutually exclusive deal. We can't do both things at once. And it's a good thing because otherwise we would aspirate and choke every time we ate. As adults, you can only either take a breath in or you can uh, take food in. It is one or the other. But babies can. Babies have a very highly placed larynx, which are the vocal cords. Now, they sit so high up into the neck that that larynx almost acts like a snorkel and allows this nasal, uh, what do they call it? It allows a nasal breathing channel to occur over where the baby is eating into the esophagus. So they literally, they can breathe while they eat. Or it's really, really close. Um, So the idea is that they can then hold the latch and breathe through their nose cyclically, which is why they never stop eating. Their jaw goes all the time, but they continue to breathe because they can do both at the same time. And the goal of the system here is not to allow food into the lungs. So what happens is, as they have the cyclical breathing going on while they eat, they are allowing little bits of air to go into the esophagus because that is how the system writes itself continually. Now, with the valves and the reflexes, you still get gulping and you still get drinking too fast, and that is where air gets sucked into the stomach. All right, now let's get to the positioning. This, this is the big sticks when it comes to winding babies. So this is what we generally do. This is what I find if I have a, uh, a parent in the office, I'll ask them just to put the baby onto the knee and show me how you burp your child. Inevitably, the baby is rolled over slightly forwards and the hand comes out and we start patting onto the back. Patting is an adult thing. We do it to people when they are not feeling well. When someone is crying, you put your arms around them and you pat them on the back. We do that because we want to make people feel better. And we do it with babies because we want to make them feel better. It's just the subconscious adult thing that we do. The problem with patting is we tend to pat right on that area where they hyperextend their back. So we're patting on the problem, which tightens them and allows them, well, it stops them having this um, this free flow of air coming up and down. Second of all, what ends up happening is the patting is so light at two in the afternoon and so heavy at two in the morning because the baby must go to sleep. So we want to avoid that. But the biggest thing that happens is that this air bubble, this big air bubble that needs to pop out of baby's mouth is broken down when you pat on them. 
the air bubble gets broken and sucked down and farted out. Now, the problem with that is that it looks like the air bubble disappears and they relax. But six hours later, they're going to be pulling their knees up, pulling their arms in and pushing for all they're worth to try and get that air bubble out. So we don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to straighten babies up as much as possible. Because we want that high pressure of the stomach and the low pressure of the environment to be able to connect with each other. Now, the valves we were talking about, the lower esophageal sphincter and the upper esophageal sphincter, they will open by themselves. We don't have to worry about those. We just have to get babies as straight as possible to be able to get the wind out. So the idea is a straight baby uh, with no patting on the back, and then we want to bounce slightly underneath them. Ladies, it's like if you have cake mix and you want to get the bubbles out, you bounce the cake mix onto the table, you sort of bang it on the table, and that allows the bubbles to move through the solution. Exactly the same thing as what we're doing here. We're trying to get the bubbles to move through. I do have a video on YouTube, and I would ask you just to uh, just to put my name into YouTube and with the word burping, and you'll find that video. And all that I'm talking about now will be there for you on that video. So that's the first position. The second position, we are going to move babies. Uh, they're going to sit with babies back to your chest, and you are going to put your arms underneath baby, lock the fingers around in front, and lift up. The idea for this, it's brilliant for reflux babies because we're lifting the tissues. We're lifting the stomach, lifting the esophagus, and opening around the diaphragm to allow the air to pop out. So we're going to lift them slightly up, and again, we're going to bounce underneath. And again, check out the video to see the visual of that. The last winding technique is to put babies over the shoulder, and we're going to lift their arm. We want to have their shoulder over our shoulder, because otherwise they try and climb you. So you want to have them in that position, but you don't want their knees up underneath um, their pelvis, and you don't want their knees crouching up on your shoulder. So you're going to wiggle them down slightly, and that as well is on that video. So I urge you to go and check that out, and um, and you'll be able to get the visual of what I've what I've been explaining now. On top of that, one of the other things that I've been asked a lot at the show is when do you know that you are finished with burping? And here is the easy answer. You have 20 minutes after the last uh, after the last bit of feeding when they've broken off of when you started winding. You have 20 minutes. Within that 20 minutes, the air is either out of the mouth or it has been sucked down into the intestines. And once the air is down in the intestines, it is gone. It's not coming back. Then it becomes a fart and we have to do all sorts of other things, which we'll talk about in, in further podcasts. But, um, yeah, so you have these 20 minutes to be able to get this wind out of babies. Um, so what I would suggest is not use the whole 20 minutes, but that is your marker. After 20 minutes, the air is gone one way or the other. There are little markers that babies have. Some really tighten up their mouths and they get a little bit of a blue mouth. Some babies lock their tongue up to the roof of their, or roof of their palate. Um, some babies roll their eyes or won't make eye contact. Some babies extend themselves backwards. There is no hard and fast rule when it comes to that. Um, it's, it's really up to what your baby is showing you and you have to take that into consideration. Now, the last thing I would like to touch on really, really quickly is some new research which regards hiccups. Now, hiccups, uh, we've, been, we've been talking about for a long time in practice. Moms and dads always come in and say, how do I get rid of the hiccups? How do I stop my baby hiccuping? And my answer now is if it's not interfering with the eating or the sleeping, don't bother. There are two ways. One is to give them a dummy and the other is to let them scream. Those are the two ways you get rid of hiccups. But it turns out from research, which is, which is quite new, that hiccups might be our friend. And here's how it works. Hiccups create a negative pressure or a pulling in of the chest cavity. Now, when you create a negative pressure in the chest cavity, it will pull uh, contents from the stomach up through the chest cavity. And what tends to be sitting right at that valve is the extra air. So the idea, it turns out, or theoretically what we're looking at, is that hiccups are actually helping getting that last bit of air to come up out of, out of the tummy and out of the mouth. 
And again, it's one of these times where if this is actually what's happening, that your body, by giving hiccups to the baby, is doing the absolute right thing in the absolute right circumstance. Because your body tends to work like that. It tends to do the right things at the right time. They look wrong to us because the thing that stimulated that behavior is wrong. And what stimulates hiccups is either having one big wind go up past the diaphragm or not getting air out. So that's the new interesting research that I I will leave you with on hiccups. That is burping babies. Please, if you have any questions, drmarinas at gmail.com. You are more than welcome to check that out. Um, I have also written a piece for the Peekaboo magazine for the expo that we've been at. It's titled, What If I Told You Colic Has Nothing to Do With How Much Your Baby Cries? And I'm going to put that up on my Facebook page and the Easy Baby Podcast Facebook page. So you're more than welcome to go check that out and read that there. It is a rather interesting, different take on colic babies. Quite interesting. So thank you so much for hanging out with us yet again. And as always, if you find the information uh, gives you benefit, please share and share a like to new moms and dads that are in your position and you feel they could benefit. As always, you are more than welcome to head to iTunes or Stitcher Radio. Give us the star rating that you feel that we deserve. But otherwise, I will be with you very, very soon. And until then, enjoy your baby. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. And remember to check out our pre- and postnatal education courses at easybaby.co.za. You got this.